Welcome to the CEC Report. It's Anzac Day, 25th of April. I'm Robert Barwick, and I'm joined today by a special guest, economist John Adams. Hello, Welcome, John. How are you going? Very good. How are you? Pretty good. Welcome to Melbourne. Thank you very much. All right. Today's episode of the CEC Report is a special episode where we're going to be interviewing John, and we're calling this episode, They're Going to Rape the Dollar. But before we begin, let me just make a few, um, give people a few quick updates. Uh, the uh, election campaign's underway, and what we're encouraging people to do, as we've we put out a press release yesterday announcing the CEC's slate of candidates, you can find that on our website. Um, we make the point about why we are prioritising the banking reform issue above all others, because it affects the whole the way the economy works, right? And we, we, we encourage people to give you the... the, the um, the tools on the website you can you can use to help you get the message out. We also encourage you to go and confront all the candidates in your seat on the question of bail-in, where do they stand on the bail-in theft of deposits, where do they stand on breaking up the banks, where do they stand on policies like a national bank. Now, as part of that, Senator Jane Hume, who was the chair of the banking, um, the Senate uh, Economics Legislation Committee, which has been supposedly conducting the inquiry into banking separation, and she's the one who refused to suspend the inquiry for the, for the duration of the election, right? And so she's the one who said we're going to stick to the reporting date on the 13th of May. We have noticed her popping up at campaign events, not just here in Victoria, but around the country, including in Sydney. And so we're starting a bit of a campaign. We're encouraging people, if you see Jane Hume on social media, um, on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever you might come across her doing campaign events, send her the message Aren't you too busy running a banking inquiry to be campaigning? Why are you out there campaigning when you're the one who said you could do a banking inquiry in the middle of the election? Don't let her get it. She's made a joke of this committee, this inquiry. She's, as an ex-banker, she's protecting the banks. Don't let her get away with it. Every time you see her, we'll show some images on the screen, send her that message. Shouldn't you be too busy running a banking inquiry to campaign in this election? Especially as a senator who's not up for re-election, she would have. She should be able to make the time to do that. So, that's just um, we're going to. We're not going to let Jane Hume get away with this. So, join our campaign to send that message to her. Um, but that said, let's get into it. So, special guest John Adams, welcome, John. Thanks. Today we're going to talk about they're going to rape the dollar, which yep. is which is your thesis. Um, let's begin by uh, starting where a lot of viewers would have got attention, you, you got their attention a few weeks ago when you went on the Peter Switzer program yep. to debate Christopher Joy That's correct. on whether there's going to be economic Armageddon in Australia. Now, just to set the scene, um, and you can give some some of the background yourself, but I just wanted to highlight for the for the viewers, a lot of our regular viewers would be familiar with this. They, um, uh, Christopher Joy, the Peter Switzer's show would not be a very highly rated show, rating mm -hmm. show, mm -hmm. but it would have got a lot of ratings that day when the great debate was on. But extraordinarily, when they put a video of the debate on YouTube, that channel and that show usually gets about 100 views for their YouTube videos. Your debate show has is that now over 90,000 views. About 94, 95,000 views. There you go. And, and really, you really do see the public has spoken and all the comments, or 90% of the comments, say you've won. So give the background of that show, explain what you're trying to get across and what's happened since then with your back and forth with uh, Christopher Joy. Sure, sure. So um, I've been engaged in a series of Twitter wars on social media calling out a whole host of, uh, of establishment uh, uh, economists, commentators who keep on saying everything's fine, um, you know, get out there and borrow, there's no bubble, um, things like you know, there is nothing to be concerned about. Um, a lot of these people have vested interests, they're tied into the banks, uh, the people have finance companies like you know, Peter Switzer, it's on the record, he's a mortgage broker as well as a media commentator. So uh, I started to get frustrated in saying that the, the commentary is not commensurate with the facts um, uh, and, and there's a lot more risk an, around household debt, around foreign debt um, and, and, we, you know, and, and individuals who listen to the mainstream are signing mortgage documents on the basis that they think everything is fine and yeah. everything is, is far from fine. So, so, so this is where, you know, probably in the last uh, two months, two and a half months, I've started to attack certain individuals on Twitter and, and with Switzer. Uh, you know, what riled me up was Martin North was in his show in late January 
Uh, he stacked the panel with uh, two establishment economists, the chief economist from the Commonwealth Bank, as well as a, a Keynesian economist from Deloitte Access Economics. Um, I didn't think it was a, a genuine discussion. I think I thought it was sort of skewed towards the establishment position. And, so and it's not just the establishment, though. They're, your point is they're also vested interests. Absolutely. So, yeah, if you're a bank economist, you cannot honestly tell the public what you think because you have an employment and fiduciary duty to the bank. Yep. If you said the sky's about to fall in, there will be a run on the bank. And so they're, they're constrained in what they say. But also, when you look at dollar access economics, there are, there are obviously commercial relationships have to be protected. You can't go out on a limb and say something that's uh, too extreme or yeah. or things that clients may not want you to be able to say. So this is where you get the group think consensus. And so I started calling Switzer out. We started having back and forth. And where it ended up was I challenged Switzer to a live 90 minute debate on YouTube. The, the, the view was I'd, I'd get him down to Wollongong on Martin, in, in Martin North studio. And I said, man to man, let's have it out. And so, he, ref he didn't uh, take that offer up. Uh, the net, you know, within within 12 hours, he then gives me an invite onto his show. He goes, and he didn't tell me who. He goes, I have someone to come and debate you. Uh, would you come on my show? I said, I don't. Well, I don't care who you've got on to debate. Um, why, why, don't, why don't you? Uh, you know, I'll be there on Monday and let's have the debate. So, so, so that's where he said afterwards when I accepted, it's Christopher Joy. Now, I didn't know much about Christopher's history, uh, and I did a bit of research about his position. But, but, but yeah, we, we get to we get there to the Monday. Uh, I mean, we, we all hyped it up. He hyped it up. Yep, yep. I hyped it on on Twitter. News.com actually had a story about the great debate. We promoted it on this show. Yes, yes. So, so and I did a show, uh, a small clip with Martin North about the debate. So, so we get there. Uh, debates, uh, I think we, we started filming uh, live at 7.30 in the evening. So I'm in there in the studio with, uh, with um, Christopher Joy in the back, and we're having a discussion. And I'm sort of saying, well, you know, good to meet you. This is who I am. This is the broad thesis. And, you know, the funny thing is we had a l large uh, level of agreement before we got on camera. Now, and if you notice at the end of the debate, Christopher Joy said, if we have a global recession, Quote, all bets are off. Now, um, the, you know, so, 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 so the Armageddon that I've been talking about is um, if the world blows up. Yep. Um, because that's been the history of Australian economic history for 200 years. If there's a global shock, a global recession, we uh, uh, yeah, we get hit. And we are, I would say, the most vulnerable in 200 years uh, in terms of the, the state of the economy. Um, and there's a lot of uh, households that just don't have it, like a lot of buffers if, if uh, unemployment was to go up dramatically or if interest rates were to go up dramatically. So, so that is where we agree. Uh, and, 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 you know, and, and I think that's the, the key point, that, that you know, there was actual agreement on camera on this point. Now, where, where some of the disagreement did occur was if the world doesn't blow up, um, what would happen to house prices? Um, uh, and, and, and now, uh, it is a radical proposition. So I put out a piece last month with um, uh, Martin North and an Irish expert called Eddie Hobbs on the point of could Australia, you know, we're seeing that house prices have been fallen in Sydney 14%. Uh, house prices in Melbourne have fallen about 10.3%. Uh, so we're starting to see this housing bubble unravel. Could this, could this pancake into a more systemic collapse uh, independent of the world? And could we potentially trigger a global crisis ourselves? Now, this is, so we put our piece on news.com and Frank Chun, who's the finance editor, you know, helped, helped us put this piece together. Now, I, I admit it's a very radical thesis because in 200 years it's never happened to us. We've never been the catalyst, but we thought there's enough evidence to, to at least put the idea out there just yep. to, get, to, get, to people, get the people thinking. Well, it's something that we'd, we'd been saying for a long time. We noticed the IMF, in 2012, the IMF said, Australia's financial system is globally systemically important. In other words, we're capable of creating a global shock. That's essentially what that means. But since you've said it, other people have also come out and echoed and said that sounds right. Yes, yes. I mean, look, actually last week on the Kaiser Report, which was on the Russia Today program, they had, had a, an American um, economist who also expressed that Australia could be the catalyst for the, for, for the next global financial crisis. Uh, and, and Kaiser said, oh, I've never heard that thesis before. So I quickly got on Twitter and said, hey, thing is, I published something like a, <laughs> about a month earlier to say, to say that, you know, in Australia, there are a few people who are recognising uh, that particular point. So, so, so that, I think, is where the contention is. Um, it, but, but, but is there too much debt? Well, off camera, Christopher said yes. Um, it, you know, is there rising risk? 
the answer that we said to yes. And at one stage, I said to Switzerland, should we do even do the debate? We're, we're agreeing so much. Um, the thing is, like, you know, so this is all off camera. You're the, in, yeah, in agreement. Yeah. We're all in agreement la yeah. largely. Then when we, when we when the camera rolls, uh, now the thing is, um, you know, actually before the camera rolls, I said to these guys, the media. So I said the, the people out there don't trust you, and it, it, you know, if you are willing to acknowledge that we've got some big problems your credibility will rise. And I said this before to the both of them. As soon as the camera rolls, um, it was a 180 flip by, by Christopher Joy. Well, um, just hold that thought. We're going to take a break. When we come back, you can give the, the essence of his argument and what's been exposed since. Welcome back to the CEC Report with my special guest is economist John Adams. And we're discussing they're going to rape the dollar. Now, John, just before the break, you were giving the background to your great debate with Christopher Joy and how he had a different personality off camera than on camera. Correct. So when the camera started rolling, what was his argument against your warnings about debt? Well, so, so he, he, his, his broad issue is, is that the, the debt, uh, the, the, the level of debt in the economy now, it is, is serviceable. That, that was the essence of his argument. Now, um, he had a chart. The basis is that house prices follows the growth of income. Um, uh, now, I mean, what, what really drives um, house prices is the amount of debt you pump in the system. It's not necessarily income. The lending from the banks. Exactly. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, so I, I thought there was a bit of a skewed argument. Now, to be honest, um, I, I had uh, some additional graphs that I could have uh, put up on the screen that could have... Um, further enhanced my argument compared to his argument, but when you when you, when it, when it's like a very compact show, you didn't have the opportunity to really go into sort of technical arguments about it. But the other thing is, is that you know, the, going into that debate, I didn't want to have a technical debate because because yeah, yeah. the the audience is not is non technical, um, and basically I want to get across some key themes about there's too much debt, we have a problem, it, you know, uh, we are at risk of a systemic crisis. Um, and, and, and I thought if I could at least get acknowledgement on those particular points, then then I would have I would have been able to achieve what I wanted to achieve, which is on mainstream media a recognition that there that there is a problem. Um, and, and to be honest, when on Twitter and YouTube they all said I won the debate, uh, and again I haven't necessarily declared I've won because I was neutral on that, but the audience said by far that I won the debate. Whereas Christopher Joyce says he won the debate. And he I said got, TKO. He said TKO, um, and, and I received further correspondence with him in the last 24 hours to say well, that... Before you get to the correspondence... Well, he's reiterating that correspondence, hasn't he? Yes, yes. Yeah. But, 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 but the thing is, so, so, I mean, the, the whole thing was a setup. I mean, Christopher, Peter Switzer, the, 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 the day after, writes an editorial and, and says that Christopher Joy won the debate. Now, what I think they didn't anticipate was the, the amount of interest in the debate in terms of the views, but, yeah. they, but they, I think Switzer was shocked with the level of uh, commentary on social media to say that I actually won. So, so I think there's an acknowledgement that there, that there is a problem. But, 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 but yeah, so, so the establishment line is, yes, house prices are falling, they're gonna cut interest rates, they're going to loosen lending, and, and the market's gonna stabilize. Now, uh, myself, and what I say in the debate? If credit growth to housing continues to fall, this, the soft lending thesis will not eventuate and we could easily end up like Ireland. And obviously this is where Eddie Hobbs from Ireland comes in because he's been sort of coaching me along because he said before you see unemployment go up, before you start to see defaults, there's a whole host of early warning indicators that potentially could come about. And, and he's been coaching me to say, well, these are the things you, we saw in Ireland. These are the things you should be looking for in Australia, uh, and, and so far, and we're still collecting some evidence on this, so far I'm seeing a, a, a number of these indicators happening in Melbourne in particular. Yeah. So I think Melbourne's in a far worse shape compared to, compared to Sydney. But in terms of you know, the, the title of the show about where is the rape of the dollar? Now, we have a massive amount of foreign debt. Um, a lot of that foreign debt is in the, is, is, particularly the short-term foreign debt, is tied in the banks uh, that have gone into the households. So. The establishment doesn't want the housing market to collapse because they'll be blamed for it because they blew up the bubble in the first place. So um, w my big concern is um, that they are going to effectively sacrifice the dollar. So if unemployment... And what form will that take? Just, to, just elaborate on so, so, what it Yeah, so, 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 so the, in the form it will take is if unemployment goes up, if you start to see uh, an increase in the reason defaults, if, if the banks start to look shaky, they will, they will lower interest rates, I think, to zero, potentially. They will do quantitative easing. They will get the new 
what I think will be the shortened government to, 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 to start spending big in Canberra, to prop the market up. And all of these things um, uh, do not bode well for the value of the Australian dollar. It doesn't bode well for the serviceability of the foreign debt. And if we get to a point in which confidence in our ability to service our, our foreign debt, and just for the audience, uh, we have $2.2 trillion of gross foreign debt. So, you know, uh, net is like 1.08 trillion. It is, it is a record in the amount of foreign debt we have. If there is just a, a smidgen of doubt in, in, in our, among foreign investors as to our ability to service this debt, the dollar will crash. And my big concern is there's not a voice in parliament who is expressing concern about the dollar, concern about that, that, that all of these suggested policies around quantitative easing, zero interest rates, negative interest rates, uh, and, and more spending, but also loose bank, bank standards, what, what, the, what this could potentially do to, to, to the, the foreign debt and then in terms of the dollar. So, so this is where, just, just to highlight this point, this is where in the debate I kept on saying the policy prescription that the, the financial, Australian Financial Review and Christopher Joy and others are saying, these are things we will do to stabilise the housing market, it comes at a cost. Yeah. Uh, and, and my big concern is no one in the public sphere, but also in Parliament, is actually wrecking, telling the public there's a cost and what are the consequences of this particular course of action. Well, well, we had a discussion yesterday, you and I, we had a meeting with economist Dr Peter Brain, and he has a very interesting insight into the structure of that foreign debt that he's written in this book called Credit Code Red. I hope to interview him on this program soon. Just explain his concern about what happens with the structure of our foreign debt and why we're really at risk here. Sure. So, so gross foreign debt is about two point two trillion. Um, uh, now that that debt is it has different levels of maturity. So you look at the debt that that um, you know ninety day debt is about four hundred eighty billion dollars. So nearly half a trillion dollars. Yeah. But but maturity up to one year is about seven hundred and nineteen billion dollars. So um, because we have so much short term foreign debt, um, you know. It, 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 it is very likely we don't have a lot of foreign exchange reserves. That that if if interest rates was to go up dramatically, global interest rates. If, for example, our creditors didn't want to roll over these loans, we don't have a lot of wiggle room to be able to uh, um, you know service these debts or to roll them over. So that so for the debts to continue. And, and the debt hasn't been incurred on investing in things that might help to pay it back. His argument was it's been incurred on lending and for housing. Exactly. So of the two point two trillion. What Peter was telling us yesterday is a trillion of the 2.2 is in households. So when, when, when a household has a mortgage, uh, what the household, the average Aussie household has to realise is, is that a trillion, uh, well, part of their mortgage, they have to, uh, they owe it to a foreign creditor yep. um, in a foreign currency. Yes, that's the key bit there. Yes, yes. So, 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 so now his concern is around serviceability of the foreign debt so, and the stability of the dollar because so, so basically, we, and this is what I was saying in the debate, either we let the housing market crisis go or the housing market go, or if we're going to prop that up, it comes at the cost of the foreign debt and then in terms of the dollar. Now, Well, you uh, said that, but also um, Christopher Joy effectively premised his defence of the current system on the fact that all those options are available. Right, he agreed with those, yeah, yeah, but he yeah, thinks yeah. they're good options. Yes, yeah. yeah, so he says there are options available, and there, there are options available, but what he and the AFR yeah. and others are not willing to acknowledge is the consequences and the cost of that. Now, um, the, the, one of the key things that Peter told us yesterday that I thought was very uh, um, important is in 1951, in 1962, in 1991, Australia dramatically raised interest rates to stop a default on the foreign debt. So yeah. if confidence starts to, uh, so starts to erode in, in our ability to service the foreign debt, if the dollar starts to crash, well, uh, in, in times, we've got two options there. If we let the dollar go, we get, we get a runaway inflation, um, you know, 10, 20, 30%, um, and, and we're going to have a banana republic sort of, you know, even if you look at Venezuela or Argentina, or, or the, or the, obviously Venezuela has hyperinflation. So, so, so that's that path. If you say, no, we're going to defend the dollar, once confidence goes, you, you, you've got to dramatically raise interest rates. You look at Argentina last year, they went from about 20% to 60% within the matter of a few months. You look at the UK in the early 90s, within a day, they raised interest rates 5% of the day. And if they raise interest rates like that here, we're gone as... Well, well yeah, so 80%... Hang on, hold that thought. Let's continue it after the break.
Welcome back to the CEC report where I'm discussing with my special guest, John Adams, the rape of the dollar. So John, what happens if they raise interest rates here? So, so about 80%, so, so I went to the Reserve Bank last year and asked them, of those that have a mortgage, what proportion of, uh, of households have variable interest versus fixed interest? And they said as of data of November 2017, 80% of households have variable interest. So, so nearly four in five variable interest. If all of a sudden the dollar starts to tank, the serviceability of the foreign debt comes into question and they say, well, we need to, we need to stop uh, the slide in the dollar and we need to dramatically raise interest rates. Well, you know, if you go on 5% in a day and you've got 80% interest and everyone's leveraged to yeah. the hilt, um, I mean, see, it's good night, Australia. Yeah, and that'll, that'll crash the banks and possibly trigger this global crisis we're talking about. Just one last thing, though, back on the debate. So, so people need to know this. Um, Christopher Joy himself, his main argument to you was the debt serviceable. The reason he sent you this email yesterday taking umbrage at what you've been saying is because you have exposed him and that particular argument. Y yes, yes. Well, so Christopher Joy, he, he, he manages a bond fund, uh, about, about, about $2 billion. Um, he has historically invested in residential mortgage-backed securities. Now, uh, according to analysis from Digital Finance Analytics, Martin North, uh, banks in general put some of their best mortgages in, the, in these, in these uh, bonds and then they sell them to the market because they basically want investors to be able to hold them. Um, uh, now, you do, have, you do have different levels, but from, from the evidence to date, it's not like when the Americans put in just sort of toxic stuff. So, so you start to see the better quality stuff in these bonds. Well, um, uh, Christopher Joy basically has been putting out posts on social media to say that the risks in these bonds are starting to go up quite, 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 quite dramatically. And so if the, be if the better mortgages are in these bonds and the risks are rising, in these bonds, which Christopher acknowledges, what does that mean for the rest of the serviceability of, of the rest of the mortgage book? Uh, and, and the key point I'm trying to say is, well, by your own social media posts, you are effectively conceding that the, 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 that the, debt, the debt is not serviceable. But this was his key argument in the debate as to why the housing market will not crash independent of the so global he was like, he's either Because he made these social media posts after the debate, he's either been convinced by what you said during the debate in which case he should have made a mea culpa and said I was wrong, John was right. Or he's thought this all along, he's known all along there's a debt serviceability problem. He has. And therefore, what do you call what he said in the debate other than is that the truth? Well, 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 the thing is, is that he has accused me of being deceptive and misleading. Um, <laughs> I, I will return the accusation and say perhaps he was deceptive and misleading. To the, to the unsophisticated borrower who heard him say that debt serviceability at this point is fine. Yeah. Well, look, John, um, your role in highlighting this issue has become very prominent in the last 12, 18 months ago or so. In fact, I, I'll, let me take a little bit of credit for boosting your profile and doing this. This is, I believe, the last time you appeared on the show was the second time you did a show like this, and since then you've done a lot of shows with Martin North. Um, but now, you know, you've, you're forcing them to debate you. I think we can talk, we'll talk in the next episode after this for next week about what's happening with the RBA and some of the, the things you've, you've forced them to do there. So this is very important because we have to bring people to the understanding. Before we can have a solution, you've got to get everyone to acknowledge there's a problem, right? And I think um, what I, the way I see it is we're building a bit of a brains trust in Australia now with our work, with your work, with people like Wilson Sy, who's with the meeting we had yesterday with Peter Brain, people who know there's a problem. And Martin North, obviously. Martin North, obviously, and we can, we can start to, from that standpoint, then discuss what to do about it. But we've run out of time for this episode, so thanks very much for joining us on the CEC Report. Thank you. You're welcome back. Thanks to viewers for tuning in. Tune in next week for more of the show and John Adams.